Tim Graham and Friends is brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and business consultants. CTBK is a leading accounting firm with a growing team of accountants and business consultants with roots in Amherst, New York. CTBK pairs every project with a focus on a human connection between its team and the client for assurance, accounting, taxes, litigation support, and advice on mergers and acquisitions, CTBK is available and ready to solve any issue your business faces. For a consultation or to request a quote, call 716-630-2400. Again, that's 716-630-2400. CTBK, over a quarter century of proven accounting and business excellence for Western New York and beyond. Thank you for joining another edition of Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTBK. I am Tim Graham of The Athletic here, as always, joined by Matthew Fairburn of The Athletic. He covers the bills and Jonah Bronstein of the Bronstein subsidiary group uh, here to talk about uh, a handful of topics today. I want to get into Josh Allen's stance on vaccines or at least the COVID vaccination anyway. And um, I want to talk about the fallout at Cumulus. And I'm sure that we'll get into a couple other subjects uh, before we wrap this up. Uh, but um, for those who haven't been following along, there were some uh, more terminations at Cumulus over uh, the, uh, the Rob Lederman racist bit uh, that took place uh, a couple of weeks back and Marcel Louis Jacques uh, came on the podcast last week to discuss uh, in depth with us his experience uh, with 97 Rock and and I spoke about my experience uh, at Cumulus and since that show uh, more people have lost their jobs so um, I want to touch on that but uh, let's get started with um, an awkward an awkward story, I think, this week. Awkward on multiple levels. Uh, Josh Allen uh, appeared on Kyle Brandt's podcast, 10 Questions, in which he was asked about whether or not he would get uh, vaccinated from the coronavirus. And he was wishy-washy about it. I think uh, maybe it was a case of a guy in, uh, in the spotlight who was trying to serve, uh, play it down the middle, serve serve multiple masters, uh, whatever phrase you want to use, and kind of stepped in it a little bit uh, regarding um, whether or not he is going to get the vaccine. He says he hasn't uh, done enough research in it and doesn't know. Should we, but then, should we read the quote? I have oh, it up. Do you oh, wanna, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I think Absolutely. that's fair because I think that's been a, a criticism of some of the many critics uh, of people that are covering this, you know, is not having the whole thing. So Kyle Brandt asked Josh Allen if he had gotten the vaccine. Josh said that he had not. Kyle asked him if he were, was eager to do it, if it was something he was interested in. And Josh said, I'm still debating that. I'm a big statistics and logical guy. So if statistics show it's the right thing for me to do, I'd do it. Again, I'd lean the other way too, if that's what it said. I haven't been paying attention to it as much as maybe I should have. I've just been doing my thing and masking up when I'm going out and just staying close and hanging around family. I think had it ended there, um, this would have been less of a, of a storm on Twitter. Um, Kyle Brandt then followed up and asked whether Josh, you know, what Josh Allen thought about the fact that the NFL it was looking like the NFL was not going to mandate this vaccination for players. And he said, I think everybody should have the choice, that choice to do it or not to do it. You get in this tricky situation now where if you do mandate that, that's kind of going against what our constitution says and the freedom to kind of express yourself one way or the other. I think we're in a time where that's getting a lot harder to do everybody should have that choice. So that's the framework off of which we are working here just before anybody jumps on and says we're cherry picking quotes. That was the entire exchange in question. So it turned into a bit of a uh, cluster fudge uh, for Josh Allen. 
um, from people who had his back. And I think that Bill's fans, uh, it was <laughs> not amazing because it's come to be expected. Anything Josh Allen says or does is going to be wholly supported or as essentially uh, fully supported uh, by the fan base because they love Josh Allen and they don't want Josh Allen to encounter any turbulence. But I think nationally, uh, it, um, it, it didn't look that great for Josh. Uh, in fact, I, I would point to Josh Mankiewicz, who is a host of Dateline on NBC, retweeted uh, some of the comments that Josh Allen said and uh, led off his tweet with, and I'm paraphrasing, proof that you don't need to be smart to read a defense. Um, so whether or not you believe with uh, Josh Mankiewicz or not, uh, the fact that somebody so prominent in the media was then uh, sharing Josh Allen's thoughts in such a way, uh, I'm sure uh, that the Buffalo Bills would rather Josh Allen have not said what he said. Uh, but um, what about the points he raises? Um, Jonah, I'll ask you, um, what, what are your thoughts on this as um, either what he said or the, whether or not this is even a story? Well, I agree with the, the analysis you just shared from Megwitz. It is a stupid take, especially to say, to preface it with, you know, I don't make my decisions until I have all of the data and the statistics and the information and the logicalness or whatever he said. And then to come back with the, I don't have enough, you know, the, the take that you would have if you haven't looked at the statistics or you're looking at the wrong statistics or you're misinformed in some way, uh, you're an anti-vaxxer going into this. But that said, I don't really think it's that bad of Josh Allen to have a stupid take or a wrong take. He's 24 years old. Uh, he's probably influenced by the people in his life, older people in his life or different media that he's consuming. And I, one thing I do appreciate is when Josh Allen does these podcasts, he gets more open and honest and seems to share the actual thoughts in his head a lot more than he does when he's talking to the media and that's probably true of, of all players, but you, it seems like you get the real Josh Allen in these podcasts with Barstool or Kyle Brandt a lot more than we get when he's speaking to the local media. So whether he's saying something dumb or not, I kind of like that he's saying at least what's on his mind. And nobody should really take what the quarterback of the Buffalo Bills says seriously in this regard or shouldn't be making their own decision about a vaccine because of what a football player says, not the president and he's not really qualified to be espousing any advice on this subject. We also know how fans think, and I'm not just talking about Bill's fans, but you know, Josh Allen has a lot of fans around the country, and if somebody is saying that he doesn't know if he trusts the science, and he didn't say that. He says he hasn't looked into it enough, uh, but then he cites the Constitution and having your right to choose um, and to express yourself. Um, it does flirt with danger, uh, I think, um, to, to speak in such a way. And, and maybe and a lot of people talk about how Josh Allen is aware beyond his years and so polished and all these things that he says in an interview. I think he needed to be more aware there that exactly like you said, Jonah, the quarterback of the Buffalo Bills, 24 years old, probably shouldn't even be talking about this at all. Yeah, there's, there's a, I think the biggest takeaway for me from the whole thing is that this guy needs to be more mindful and careful with his platform and what could, you know, kind of, and you could say it's not his fault that it became what it became. And you could say he didn't say anything wrong, but I think he showed a general carelessness with his words on a really important topic um, with a pretty easy answer. Uh, and that's regardless of, of where you stand uh, on the vaccine. The, the easy answer is to stop at the beginning of the answer. I don't really know. I haven't done enough homework. He had twice in the interview, he prefaced, opinions with, I don't, I haven't done enough homework or I need to do more research, but here's the take. 
I don't know if that's a way to soften his take or like you said, play both sides or what it is, but I think the people out there, you know, and Jonah, Jonah makes this point, which is 100% true that nobody out there should be taking their medical advice from the 24 year old quarterback of the Buffalo bills. I think that's a given. And I think most logical people would take that as a given. I don't think anybody is sitting at home saying, well, there's some appointments available. I really got to wait to see what Josh Allen's doing. Like I'm not, you know, they might be saying that with their next pair of sneakers uh, or, you know, what hat they wear next, but I don't think they're saying that with their vaccination. But what about the people? But the problem is, the problem is it becomes a source of confusion for people because as you mentioned, there were a lot of fans who responded to these quotes defending Josh Allen. They would defend Josh Allen for almost anything, uh, regardless of what he said. They were going to go to battle for their guy. And I think what it created a really unhealthy and really uh, frustrating dialogue on Twitter that I really did not want to be a part of. You and I texted about it, about whether we were going to write about it. And where I fell on it was that I had some thoughts, but I did not want to be a part of the the conversation because it had stooped to a level that I thought was extremely unhealthy and unproductive. But the fact of the matter is that conversation was happening. There were people defending him and what he said and his right to have an opinion and, you know, X, Y, and Z. So whether you're taking your medical advice from Josh Allen or not, isn't really the issue. The question is, he made, he created more confusion. Are there people who are on the fence about getting vaccinated? Yes. Uh, you know, are those people within their rights to be on the fence? Absolutely. But when you have somebody who openly admits to not knowing, then creating confusion, I could see somebody sitting on the fence, hearing those comments and saying, what does he know that I don't know? You know, what, what, what research should I be doing? And that causes hesitation that really, as a country, we don't need. There's also a lot of people that agree with them. You know, it's probably a minority opinion that you're skeptical about. But agree with them on what? Because he didn't, he did, he like didn't go all the way. Well, but the people that don't want to get the vaccine think the vaccine is dangerous or are skeptical about getting the vaccine or think we're being forced to take these vaccines when we shouldn't be. Um, You know, it's, it's a minority opinion, but I don't think it's a very small minority. I think there's a large subset of the population that is either skeptical about the vaccine or is spreading the skepticism about the vaccine. And I think this is a window into whatever media that Josh Allen is consuming or social media memes that are coming across his feeds and his phone. I don't think this is something that Josh Allen meditated about and came up with on his own. These are opinions that are being put in his head by something that he is seeing or watching or listening to or viewing or hearing from friends and family in his life. And he, he did try to play down the middle. I think that he gave, as, as you say, Jonah, and this is just my take on it. He gave a glimpse that I think it seems given his druthers, he wouldn't get the vaccine uh, because otherwise, why would he middle it and talk about the constitution and, Or maybe he just doesn't want or maybe he is going to get the vaccine. Maybe he's had the vaccine and he has people in his life who he doesn't want to just come out and make some declaration because he doesn't want to have to deal with it um, at home or at the gym or whatever. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why he may have been trying to play it down the middle. Um, His dad had COVID. Is that right? Well, His dad had pneumonia. Um, I'm not sure that it was COVID back during the playoffs. Um, But uh, the danger I think is that he said enough and left the door open that his comments could be used. Like you say, Jonah, by people who are anti-vax, which is the extreme or people who just don't want to get the vaccination. Uh, It left that door open. So that way they could use it as okay, as an excuse, because that, you know, we know how people consume media. They, they bend it to their, their desires and their opinions. So it was a malleable bit of, um, information. He tried to play down the middle. It really became usable by those who, who don't want to get the vaccine, vac- vaccine or espousing that it's dangerous or, you know, any kind of extreme belief that's out there. They could, they could you, 
chalk up Josh Allen as an ally, I guess, for, um, you know, in that regard. Um, and I think, too, uh, I guess, Matthew, regarding what you said, yet, well, you both made the point. You're not going to get your advice from Josh Allen or wait and see what he's going to do. But there is a segment of the population out there, sports fans, who only who don't tune in to CNN or Fox News or NPR or any news for that matter. They get their news filtered through Sports Center, through podcasts, through things, you know, sports, because they, you know, these things filter through. And so this becomes a mainstream story. Uh, or it comes through on Sports Center about Josh Allen's thoughts or NFL Network or whatever. And then that is the information that they are getting. They're not listening to, to Anthony Fauci or the CDC or listening to medical experts on any of the spectrum of news programs out there. But when Josh Allen talks about it, it does make news on the sports channels and that's what they get. So that's where I think it, it can be dangerous. And that's, that's not Josh Allen's fault. Again, be, uh, with the exception of at some point, he's got to realize this is a minefield and I, it does me no good to try to go skipping through it um, just because I want to, you know, have this good natured discussion or, or not, you know, make the host look bad or whatever. Just go ahead and say, I, I don't feel comfortable talking about it. Yeah. There's an awareness that I think needs to happen there of exactly what you're talking about that, what he says can filter its way in through any number of channels. Like I said, there might be people out there that say, gee, like what, what does Josh Allen know that I don't know? He's got access to some pretty good doctors as an NFL player, presumably, and some pretty good information. He's got a lot of money. He's probably got the best health care and insurance and everything that you can, that you can imagine. So what does he know that I don't know? Or flip side, like, Josh Allen's a healthy 24 year old man. There's a lot of people that I saw on Twitter saying he's a healthy 24 year old man that stands to make a lot of money off his body. And if he doesn't want to put something in his body, that's, that's his choice. And, you know, people might see that and say, you know what? Yeah, I'm, I'm a healthy 24 year old man myself. And like, I, you know, maybe I don't want to do that. So again, it's, it's, this is to me much less about like Josh Allen you know, people made it out to be a, that people were taking their medical advice directly from Josh Allen, which I think is kind of skewing the the point and really moving the goalposts on this whole thing. It's like, nobody's really saying that that's kind of a, a straw man. Like nobody's accusing anybody of directly listening to Dr. Josh on their, their vaccine advice, but that's not the only way that that information could impact people. And the other thing I saw a lot of was, you know, this man has a right to his opinion and, you know, that, that needs to be, you know, everybody share, people share their opinion and now look, look what's happening. Well, you know what? He does have a right to an opinion and everybody else has a a right to tell him that that opinion is lousy. Um, And when you preface your opinion with, I haven't done enough research, you can't really cry about people being mad about your opinion because you're admitting that it's an an ill-informed opinion. And if it's not an an ill-informed opinion, show us in some way. You know, I I think that is, that was a major point of frustration for me, this idea that somehow Josh Allen was being silenced for his opinion, which is just not true. He professed that he didn't, it wasn't educated. Right. And he did it later. Fully educated. He did it later in the conversation with the franchise tag. Um, which I thought he had a pretty good take on the franchise tag, but he prefaced it with, you know, he said, Oh, one word response to what he thinks of the franchise tag is you. And then, you know, Kyle Brandt asked him to expand on it. He said, well, I need to do more homework. That's only an escape. That's like trying to get out of your opinion before you even give your opinion. I don't really know what it is, but like, and that's one thing with the franchise tag, like it's a fun little sports debate topic. Um, certainly one of consequence for a lot of players uh, financially, but much different than a a global pandemic and a a vaccine where, you know, you're creating unnecessary confusion as somebody who's, oh, and is there some level of, like I said, when I read the quote, if he stopped at the first quote, he's probably okay in a manner of speaking. Like 
he said, hey, I don't really know yet. I need to do more homework. If the numbers say to get it, which by the way, they mostly do, um, you know, numbers I've seen the, you know, and I saw some people saying like, oh, he doesn't work for the CDC. He doesn't have to give the standard CDC answer. It's like, he doesn't work for the CDC, but what other qualified, you know, disease control or medical unit does he work for? He doesn't. So we don't need to take, you know, I, I think a lot of people take your right to say whatever you want and do whatever you want and put that before everything else, which, you know, kind of creates a lot of what we saw on Twitter, you know, the other day where people were more concerned about Josh Allen's right to say what he wants, which frankly should not be a concern because I don't know who is, you know, limiting Josh Allen's ability to express himself in this country. Yeah. I didn't hear of anybody canceling future segments with Josh Allen or interviews that were, you know, uh, that people aren't saying Josh Allen's no longer welcome. He's going to be able to talk on any platform he wants. Uh, and if he wanted to go on any show today to clarify his comments or whatever, he would be on NFL network or ESPN or, or whatever, put him on first take. He'd whatever the biggest sports platform you want to put him on, he'd be on it. Uh, nobody's going to turn down that. Interview. He did slip in, in that second quote, you know, he said, you get in this tricky situation now where if you do mandate mandate that that's kind of going against what our constitution says and the freedom to kind of express yourself one way or the other. I think we're in a time where that's getting a lot harder to do, which is a veiled statement about something. I don't know what, I don't know that he'll ever clarify that, but it was a veiled statement that I think triggered a lot of people and, and kind of resulted in what you said. And if he, if he really thinks that it's a lot harder for Josh Allen to express himself in this country, or it's a lot harder. That seemed to be some sort of statement on cancel culture or whatever else. I'm not really sure, but again, the awareness of the platform here, the awareness of what you're saying and, and the weight that your words carry, those things are going to trigger people. And he, you have he to came very close in that comment to declaring that he felt any mandate of a vaccine is unconstitutional or maybe he did say that i mean but i'm giving him a little bit of he didn't he didn't say that specifically word for word but he said it kind of goes against the constitution well going against the constitution is unconstitutional yeah, you know he so pretty much we're playing that. semantics here but he's not but, a constitutional scout he doesn't really know he's not. He's no about. absolutely not but i think it, so then my my question to him would be and I, I'm not blaming Kyle Brandt for this because I don't think it was news at the time. But, you know, if what I'm curious to know now, does he believe that what the New York Rangers and the New York Yankees have done is unconstitutional? Because later that day, the New York Yankees put out a statement that we as an organization, we as a team are getting vaccinated. The New York Rangers, I believe, had done it on Monday, maybe Tuesday. But the new, so as a team, you have the leagues aren't making it happen, but the teams um, would he would he think it's unconstitutional if the Pagulas or even you know Brandon Bean or Sean McDermott whoever decides we as a team are getting vaccinated? Um, so that's yeah, that was the landmine yeah, I think there. The, I think, I think was, the, that, was that Constitution comment. I think the 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 part of that that you know the Rangers got vaccinated as a team. Did they force it? you know, like the language there probably matters, right? Like, did they force it? Or if there was a guy who said, Hey, I don't want to do this for X, Y, and Z reason, you know, were they okay with that? Now, here's the thing about it that is, you know, and again, I'm also not a constitutional scholar. So, you know, I am but, a lot of people don't know this. So <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting, I'm waiting my turn, but the bills, the NFL, all these places are private companies. So, you know, somebody asked me in our Q&A at The Athletic yesterday, like, could the Bills put it in his contract that he needs to get the vaccine, which is an interesting question. Um, I don't know what exactly the rules are and what you can. Well, he's already under contract. So, well, sure. In the new deal. You'd have to convince him to sign a brand new document. That's the problem. You'd have to, you can ask him, you can negotiate anything you want. You can try to put anything you want in a contract, but getting him to sign it is another question. Now, I... I think this is probably a pretty good segue into like 
probably something that most people where everybody's mind went when they heard this was like, will this guy get the vaccine? And I mean, I have to think he probably will uh, after all of this. And because of what you said, like, I don't know if the bills are going to do it as a team, but Sean McDermott was, I would say very, very strong in his response to the virus and how he handled it as a team. And I have to imagine they don't want their quarterback unvaccinated, potentially missing a couple of games. We're a half hour into this podcast, and this is we, we probably should have brought this up earlier. But the football aspect of it, you're absolutely right, Matthew. You know, Tommy Sweeney had cardiomyopathy, or he, you know, or however he was diagnosed uh, with a you know a thickening of his heart tissue because of his uh, because he contracted COVID. That tight end room was shut down a couple of times. Um, yeah, what happens from just a pure football standpoint if Josh Allen can't play for even a week? Um, or, or whatever he ends up in the protocol. Especially the Things wrong are, week, right? If it's the wrong week or right. wrong week or two, you know. Take a that's... look at Cam Newton last year, and people thought he never was the same after he came back from COVID. Um, I, I can guarantee you that Mitchell. Well, I can't guarantee you, but I think it's a safe bet that Mitchell Trubisky and Jake Fromm are going to be getting the vaccine uh, because this, you know, if if Josh Allen. Did, if, if this is true and he's, he's on the fence and he falls on the side of I'm not getting vaccinated. I mean, could you imagine, yeah, you know, you, you want as a want. fan, you should want your quarterback to be taking every step possible to make sure that he's on the field, whether it's doing sprints in, in uh, May, uh, whether it's lifting the weights, whether it's hitting the playbook, Uh, And in this case, yeah, getting vaccinated. And you say, well, I mean, the the survival rate for a 24-year-old who's in that kind of health, um, you know, has to be 99.9%. True, Uh, but it's about testing. You test positive for it, you're shut down. And if you're shut down, who knows if it shuts down your room? And then maybe even if Mitchell Trubisky does have the vaccination, you know, who knows, whatever the protocols are going to be. So it, it seems to be pretty reckless, from a football standpoint, and here's where I say from a, from a political or philosophical standpoint, I don't care if Josh Allen gets the vaccination. I truly don't. I don't care if anybody on that team does, you know, I'm getting vaccinated. I, I get my second shot tomorrow. In fact. Um, so just for the record, I mean, I'm getting vaccinated. I want my kids vaccinated. My wife's vaccinated. Um, if Josh Allen decides he doesn't want to get vaccinated, that's that's his call. Fine. I'm not going to be upset about it, but I'm not a fan of the team. I don't invest emotionally in the jerseys and the tickets and, the you know, putting the party together for Sunday mornings and, and in the afternoon and get, you know, if I'm investing my time and energy in the Bills winning a Super Bowl, um, then I want Josh Allen getting the vaccination. To me, it's it's that black and white. Well, and also – you know, it is a selfish decision to not get vaccinated for this virus or any other disease, and especially people who are totally anti-vax. I mean, Josh Allen's choosing his personal health over recommended public health, and sure, he has that right. There's no government mandate that everybody needs to get vaccinated. There's no The league hasn't collectively bargained that with the Players Association that all the players have to get vaccinated. But also, I wouldn't assume that Josh Allen's the only player on the Bills or the only player in the NFL or the only athlete that is reluctant to get the vaccine or that won't get the vaccine. LeBron James refused to, he said it was a private decision. He wouldn't say whether he is or isn't going to get the vaccine. And maybe that's what Josh Allen should have said. And maybe LeBron just doesn't want the heat either way. But I think when you do say that, it does imply that maybe you're not going to get the vaccine and you don't want to come out and say that. Um, I think there's a lot of skepticism in the African-American community about vaccines in general and this vaccine. And you're seeing that bear out with the numbers of percentage of black people who are getting vaccinated is far lower than percentage of white people in our community and other communities. So I think you'll see more, you, you will see athletes that don't get the vaccine. I'm sure of that. And I don't think it is their right maybe to make that decision, but I don't think that that is a smart thing to do or at all a responsible thing to do. Uh, for those athletes. Yeah, I think you're in a spot where 
what Josh Allen said is in line with what we've seen a lot of baseball players say, you know, it's a personal decision and, um, you know, everybody has the right to choose what they want to do. But to your point, Joan, I mean, you know, personal, personal choices have consequences for the rest of the public in this case. And I think, or even the other 52 people and coaching staff and, you know, on the roster. 100% and other people that work in the building and people who make millions and millions of dollars. And if the NFL chooses to do what other leagues have done and say, you know, if you get to this threshold of vaccination on your roster, these will be your rules and restrictions. And if you don't, you'll have the normal ones. Sean McDermott is wired in such a way. Everything is a competitive advantage everything. He's always looking for it everywhere he looks. And if being able to have lunch together, the team building, all that stuff that they might be able to do, if they get to 80%, whatever the, you know, whatever the NFL decides to do to encourage players or pressure players to get the vaccine, you have to think that that's going to be at the top of Sean McDermott's mind, all while juggling what Joan is talking about, you know, some skepticism among players potentially, but I, you can kind of go both ways here in the sense that like, on the one hand, I am at a point where I don't really want to hear from Josh Allen or baseball players or LeBron James about whether they're going to get the vaccine, unless they really feel the need like I'm not trying to what about silent. the Buffalo the Buffalo Sabers they had a team campaign yeah the, the day team that Josh Allen did the interview his his Pagula Sports and Entertainment cousins uh, with the Buffalo Sabers were doing a campaign urging people to get vaccinated yeah if somebody wants to um, say something like I said not trying to silence anybody here everybody's got the right to their opinion and freedom to express yourself that, um, you know, absolutely by all means, but asking guys, um, about it. Part of me says, I, you know, cause baseball players are getting asked about it a lot and it's to the point where it's like, do we need to hear from these guys if they're not open and willing to share? And, but then on the other hand, there is a very, very much a, a football aspect to this. Like if we go into the season and, you know, the quarterback of the Buffalo Bills is not vaccinated against the coronavirus. That is a piece of news. That is a a point a, a, a note that you know needs to be uh, kind of n- known. I think it's relevant to the on field of the football team. Now, you could say that Josh Allen could take LeBron James's route and say that's a private decision. I'm not telling you whether I was vaccinated or not. Um, and, you know, respect his privacy or whatever else. But we all know that you give up some sense of your privacy when you're an NFL football player. That's just the way it goes. That's part of what comes with. Now, if he wants to keep that private and is able to keep it locked down, then good for him. Um, But like his salary, that should conceivably be private information, but it's not. Um, You know, a lot of things about being an NFL player should be private and they're not. or should be private to the general public, but they're not because you're an NFL player. So his date of birth is on the back of his football card. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know anybody who goes around just announcing what their date of birth is. Uh, so, you know, just to, just to help with any kind of identifiers or, or, or uh, ID theft or anything like that. Um, I mean, we find out minutes after, you know, after these guys go under the knife, what surgery they had, for what ligament, by which doctor, um, you know, all these things. So yeah, HIPAA, there's no such thing as HIPAA when you're a professional athlete. So yeah, the, the privacy element is going to be really tricky to manage if he chooses. And I think after these, well, I should say, hang on. I don't want people to get, there are all kinds of waivers. Yes, you do have protections from HIPAA. I don't want to say that, but clearly, you know, if not for the waivers that you sign, when you put your name on that NFL contract, um, your employer can't just announce every week what your injury status is. You know, the, the athletic can't legally put out, you know, what we're all dealing with on a, on a weekly basis and whether or not we're going to be able to, uh, to write on Sunday um, or at, at down at the steel mill 
you know, that, uh, you know, hangs out with a, with a dislocated thumb, you know, Sharon, Sharon's uh, job at, uh, you know, you know, running the local bank, uh, is, uh, she's, uh, she's out because of a goiter, you know, you don't, uh, you don't get that in regular walk of life. Yeah. So it's going to make things interesting here in a, a month or so. And it's going to be hard too, after what he said, if by training camp, he says, I don't want to say that's a private decision. It's going to be like, well, I think we know what that means um, because you could easily quiet a lot of noise uh, by saying one thing. So, yeah, but I, I, I still want to give that out because I think it's a possibility there could be people in his life who he just doesn't want to upset. That's true. too. But again, maybe he's had yeah. the vaccine. Maybe he's already gotten it and he doesn't want whomever. Maybe he's got a buddy, you know, or, you know, somebody in his family or a guy that he has to deal with at the gym uh, who is just is against it and he doesn't want to have to hear it. So he tried to play down the middle. Although the constitution comment really, I think, opened the door to, to how he feels about that vaccine should be a constitutional or freedom of expression type choice, um, as opposed to, um, you know, the, the aspect of the common good. Uh, he didn't really focus on that too much. And that's an opinion that gets indoctrinated into you by somewhere else, because it wasn't like Josh Allen was just reading the constitution one day and saw the vaccine section and thought, you know, that I, I really got to think about that when they come to me with that needle. No, he either was watching Fox News or listening to Clay Travis or something like that who interplayed the constitutional argument with the vaccine, and that struck a chord in Josh Allen's brain that, you know, when Kyle Brand asked me about this, that'll be a really good answer. I'm going to bring that up. And we'll see, that's another interesting aspect of this um, where – you know, we talk about how this is covered and, you know, we get into kind of, you know, some media type stuff on, on here. So um, I feel like we're not, you know, going too inside baseball on our listeners, but th the fact that this, like, I doubt that question was given to Josh Allen before this podcast um, where he was like, all right, I got to have an answer. If so, then not, not great job um, on his part um, coming up with that answer. But it's interesting that this was on a podcast from a guy who was like, he's like number one Bill's honk. He's like doing the hype videos. He's, and maybe that's Josh Allen had a, a false sense of security going into I this think interview so. that we're just going to be having fun. We're going to shoot the shit. This is my guy. Like Kyle yeah. Brandt said on the podcast, I'm a huge fan of yours. Like love watching you play, rooting for your success. You know, it's uh, blurring the lines which I think to Jonah's point creates some compelling interviews from these, you know, the, the, the barstool guys are the same way. They're buddies with Josh. Allen. And that's what I was alluding to earlier, but they're Josh not. Allen maybe got into a situation where he wanted to make Kyle brand. He didn't want to leave Kyle brand hanging because Kyle brand's been good to him. And so I, he felt the need to come up with some answer that he clearly wasn't ready to give. And the word salad you know, ended up, he ended up choking on the word salad. What do you think Kyle Brandt was going for with that question? Do you think he thought he was going to get a juicy, controversial answer from Josh Allen? Or did he think I'm setting up Josh Allen with a softball here to say I'm getting the vaccine and you should too? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a great question. That's a really good question. I think, I think it's the latter. I don't think J Kyle Brandt was trying to get Josh Allen in, in any sort of hot water. I agree. Answer. I don't think he, I don't think anything about that interview suggests that he was trying to get, he, he's buddy, he, he wants to give the appearance that he's buddies with Josh Allen. Josh probably needs to know that, I guess. Well, Matthew, you, guys are, you we're, we're talking about, since we're talking about mo like motivation and the, tell, you got a press release from the show. That's right. Um, this was yesterday afternoon. So it was after, um, the interview was, took place on Wednesday. This was Wednesday. So we're recording was, um, this podcast on Friday afternoon. Yeah. So this was um, Wednesday at 2.51 p.m. So the initial podcast was posted that morning by 2.51 p.m. The conversation had 
devolved, you know, to the place where it was. Um, PR email from, you know, the company that, you know, does PR for the, the podcast. Said, Josh Allen dishes on a potential contract extension, Tom Brady, Sam Darnold, a Super Bowl celebration, Justin Bieber, and more. Um, goes, you know, an intro paragraph. Let me know if you have any questions. It is a long email. It is, you know, Bill's Mafia demanded that Kyle Brandt have Josh Allen on the show and here the ringer delivered, you know, the latest episode dropped today. Listen here, fast facts. Um, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, bullet points, some of which have additional bullet points beneath them. Uh, there are quotes, one, two, three, four quotes. Um, and there's not a single mention of the vaccine. The only COVID related question is how the COVID-19 pandemic was a silver lining and helped improve his game. Um, the franchise tag stuff was noted here. Um, the quote was not included, but the, the franchise tag was noted in the bullet points, but no mention of that um, aspect of it. So I would imagine that, you know, just following Kyle Brandt and his shtick for the last couple of years that he probably was not pumped that this happened um, and that, you know, Josh got a lot of negative attention that will probably prevent him from doing such appearances potentially in the future, um, prevent him from wanting to do such appearances in the future. Um, and not just with Kyle yeah. Brandt, probably with anybody. And, you know, it's exactly, exactly. I think in general, it was not a good day. I'm guessing for Josh Allen and I'm guessing Kyle Brandt did not. And probably not a, like a good day for access to Josh Allen for anybody in the future, because this is going to make them more guarded. I think it'll make Josh more guarded. He's always, he's always been very careful um, with things like this. I mean, this is a guy who puts on a suit for away game news conferences and then goes back to his locker stall, takes off the suit and puts on his sweatpants for the plane. I mean, he, he goes to that. He's he care. He's very careful about how he looks and, and how things uh, you know, how he's perceived. So he could um, lean into this a little bit in a number of ways. You know, J Jim Kelly didn't always say the right thing. Brett Favre has said some wacky things in interviews before. And, and I don't know if I would recommend this, but he could even lean into being, you know, MAGA quarterback that says the things that the mainstream media won't tell you. I don't really think he's going to do that, but a quarterback could decide to be the guy that will say the things about the vaccine that all the other quarterbacks are afraid to say. Well, it doesn't seem to be in his makeup uh, to, to be, be a he lone did that. wolf. I kind of want that, him to but, do that, but I don't know if that's uh, a, that's a, a PR strategy you could discuss in your next <laughs> your next lecture to your class. There, uh, I think you know there is an opening there with Drew Brees retiring. Um, you know, he stepped in it last right. last summer. Um, I do think, and that's sort of where I got, you know. Certainly, he's got a right to an opinion. He's got a right to say basically whatever the hell he wants. I mean, that's kind of the, the country that we live in. But he was very much middling those, which suggests to me, Jonah, that like your strategy you're talking about is unlikely because even in giving his opinions, he did so while tiptoeing and while qualifying with, I haven't done enough research or I haven't, you know, this or that. So, and was Don't working know. out his answer in his head while saying it. Like he could tell that that was maybe the most thought he's given to it so far. Yeah. And that might've been like, I don't know. I, like I would think that Kyle Brandt maybe would admit that's why I don't think there was a bad intent behind the question because I don't think he thought that was going to happen. Otherwise, wouldn't you bring it up beforehand? Like, Hey, are you comfortable talking about, the vaccine or maybe that's part of the the nature of the show and why it's pretty good is he just hits these guys with some unexpected stuff and you know sees how they how they do but i don't know there's probably multiple chances there to stop this from happening um even after you record you know could go back and be like hey was know, that live do we know no probably not it was not he um kyle brandt had teased it out the night before I think so. Um, All right. Yeah, well, here's the pivot. 
you know, since we're talking about things that get out on the air, um, I want to talk about what happened at Cumulus um, over the last couple of days. Uh, it was a topic of an entire show uh, one week ago when we had uh, Marcel Louis Jacques on with us to talk about his experience with 97 Rock and uh, the co-host Rob Liederman, uh, who was uh, fired for a bit that he did in which he compared, and I, I quibble with how the media has presented this, and I know it's kind of the easy way, and maybe you get too convoluted. The media has presented this as just Rob Lederman comparing the skin of black women to toast. Um, it, it's, <laughs> it wasn't just that. He was comparing the acceptability of women, of black women's skin to the acceptability of whether or not you would even want the toast. It, it, was, it was even more vulgar than just a comparison. Uh, it was whether or not it's acceptable. There's, there was a scale of acceptability for your toast as it should be, uh, or at least it is as it is with black women he's attracted to. Uh, so Rob Lederman was fired uh, the next day as advertisers pulled out, most notably Roswell Park and West Her. Um, and uh, the rest of the show was put on suspension. The rest of the show being the, 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 the namesake of the show, Rich Bull Gensler uh, and Chris Klein, who's the newsreader for the show, uh, and uh, the producer, Bobby Rosati. So they were all suspended uh, indefinitely. And then news came out um, on Wednesday that Rich Gensler and Chris Klein have been fired. So I don't really know what we want to discuss about this, just other than the fact that it was such a topic on the show uh, there has been another major development about it. Um, I, I guess I'll just leave it there. Any, any thoughts on, on what, well, you know what, let me, I'm sorry, I'm rambling. Let me make this point. Um, I do think that our podcast played a, oh, and John Hager, the program director was fired. I do think that our podcast played a part because I did hear from management from Cumulus uh, late last week uh, regarding the podcast, asking me some more questions and, uh, you know, getting into more details. Um, I feel awful that Rich Gensler lost his job. Um, I've said it before on the podcast. Uh, I'll say it again. I think Rich is a good man. I don't think that uh, his involvement in this, as far as I know, now, maybe there's more that I don't know. Um, maybe he was all for it. Hell, I, I, I don't know. You know, maybe he, he thought this, maybe this was his idea. I don't, I, that I don't know, but at least what went out on the air and based on what we know, um, you know, Rich was kind of, uh, he, he took some shrapnel in this and, uh, but we, we got into how, how culpable he should be. Uh, on the previous show and whether or not uh, he went to management with the concerns that Marcel, Marcel Louis Jacques and, and I expressed to him and how handcuffed he was with having Rob Lederman or Bobby Rosati as his producer. Um, but I feel bad for Rich because he's a good guy. His philanthropic work. I don't know anybody in the media who is as active as he is and helping to raise money for people like the, for Eric Woods foundation, for Jim Kelly um, the work that he's done helping me with my make a wish event every year. Um, and I know him personally and I've known him personally for almost 20 years. And uh, so, any, so anyway, I, I, I guess that's just my way of saying I, I it's that rich, that rich got caught up in all this. Um, I, 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 it, it, it's heartbreaking for me. And because this isn't just a, uh, his, his career at Cumulus isn't over. The state of the radio industry as it is, uh, you know, maybe 20 years ago when radio was hot and talk shows and controversy and things like that, people were looking for it. Um, he could just flip over to an intercom station. Maybe intercom wel welcomes him with open arms and says, all right, you've got the type of brand we want. You're edgy. Come over. So what? You got a little um, sideways or whatever. You come over here. But nobody's hiring in radio these days. Uh, stations are shrinking. And so the idea of Rich being able to stay in broadcasting in Western New York seems really small. Um, so for him to ha have had this happen to him because he was associated with Rob Lederman, who has never been funny and said something really stupid, um, I think is a shame. That, that's, that's 
So I'm sorry, whatever you guys think. I just wanted to, I just wanted to at least address it. Yeah, I don't have a ton to add on top of that. I mean, I don't know Rich super well, but every time I've met him, it lines up with exactly what, what you said. Um, point that was made on the, the last show is probably the only thing I'd say is that this is not Marcel's fault. Um, you know, it's Rob's fault. That's right. You know, and um, there, there are consequences when, when and stuff cumulus like this is happens. management's fault because from what I understand that as they as they looked into Rob Lederman, they found that he had a pattern of these types of things on the air, off the air, that probably he Rob Lederman got what he deserved. And he brought some people down with him in the process, you know, whether they should have said more or done more. Um, a lot of inner workings there that, you know, I'm not overly familiar with, but it's his fault. You know, he's the one who, who made this happen. Um, and, you know, that's kind of the unfortunate part for somebody like Rich um, is, you know, he's tied to the wrong guy and, you know, probably a lesson for all of us to kind of, when you see people like that, to say something um, and to do everything in your power to, to put a stop to it. So um, yeah, not, not easy to see it, see it happen to Rich, but um, certainly don't blame Marcel or, or anybody that was, vocally, you know, against, you know, speaking out against what Rob said. Not at all. And Marcel said when he was on our podcast that he didn't call for anybody to get fired. And, you know, I don't really feel myself that everybody involved needs to walk the plank here, but I'm going to give cumulus management, maybe a little bit of the benefit of the doubt that they looked into the issue. And there is some reasons why certain people were fired. Either they were involved in the planning of the segment or they should have known that this joke was coming. Great point. Didn't stop it, you know, in real time. Or, I, you know, I really feel like if Rich Gensler had said, whoa, 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 that's not okay on the radio, then that segment plays out a lot differently and it's a lot different of an issue. But at the same time, I do want to give Cumulus that benefit of the doubt. But I also wonder, because it looks like they brought in an outside PR agency to help them crisis management here. And that maybe the decision there was that, we should fire these people and we should announce that we're firing these people. And that's going to be the good PR for cumulus and 97 rock that we got rid of these bad racists, whether they were culpable or not. And now the new 97 rock is coming and we don't condone this anymore. And 97 rock did meet with the national association of black journalists. Uh, that was something that they, uh, you know, that I think the NABJ put out a statement. Uh, so, you know, they, Look, uh, I'm sure they're going to try. This is obviously bad. It's been incredibly bad for business. I just mentioned how awful the radio industry is. And to lose advertisers like Roswell Park and West Her um, and uh, Seneca, the Seneca Nation uh, pulled all of its advertising off all the stations at Cumulus, uh, even after Rob Lederman was fired. I mean, everybody's reevaluating their dollars in advertising and you know, Cumulus had to do something here, something big, I think. And, um, you know, that's, that's the problem uh, for Rich Gensler uh, is the, his name was on the show. Um, I just, uh, yeah, I just, uh, and, and you, you're right, Jonah. There are so many things we don't know. Cumulus did the investigation. They decided that Rich Gensler and Chris Klein had to go. Uh, they deemed uh, Bobby Rosati, um, uh, to be uh, outside the line of fire and, and he kept his job. Uh, so that's that. Um, anything else on that topic? All right. There's something I want to mention on a personal level. Um, I, and I'm saying it, this is, uh, you know, the phrase that gets, uh, that's been popular. I'm, I'm going to try to speak this into existence. Uh, because this is kind of an internal battle that I've been having, um, well, for a few years, really, since I left the Buffalo News, it's been this way for me. And I would like your opinions on it and your unvarnished opinions. I know you guys are be willing to do that for me. Um, I need to be better. 
And I need to not let what the Buffalo News does upset me so much. And I've been on a little bit of a Twitter tear over the last few weeks uh, regarding the Buffalo News and the decisions that are made over there and really the symptoms that I see based on decisions that are made deeper within the organization. Um, And it seems as though as time has gone on, I don't, my, my resentment for how things work over there has not faded. Uh, And quite frankly, the, the problems in the Buffalo news sports department in particular are good for me. They're good for Matthew Fairburn uh, in a way now that Jonah is not there. I mean, wherever Jonah ends up, I mean, and how, whoever he's writing for at the time, whether it's the Niagara Gazette or AP, whatever, it's really for, if you're not at the Buffalo news, the fact that they can't get their shit together is good for us. Um, but that's not the point uh, I'm trying to make here. Um, what I want to say is that I need to be better as a human being because my 30 minutes or one hour of pleasure from sending out a tweet uh, that I think is going to put somebody on notice or say, hey, I see you, um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change anything. And I need to let the Buffalo News be whatever the Buffalo News is going to be. Um, but the reason I wanted to bring it up here on the podcast is because it's easier for me to, to verbalize than it is to send out a string of tweets. And I may tweet something out later too, but um, my, when I tweet out about the Buffalo news um, and I tweet good stuff too. And I tweet the people who I, I really appreciate out there. It's from a place of uh, sadness. Uh, I think it goes back to, Jerry Sullivan and Bucky Gleason losing their columns and being replaced by somebody who's even more acidic and, and uh, subversive to the, sub- to the subscription base than they are. Um, it goes back to the people that I love. And I don't use that term lightly. There are people at that place who I love. Um, and I care for them. And I see them working hard. And I know that when you look at the newspaper industry, every dollar counts. And the return on investment that they're getting um, because of a couple of people out of a department that probably should be carrying, uh, you know, in a, in a town like Buffalo. So anyway, I'm saying this now not to rub it in or to be passive aggressive. I just want to kind of explain to myself why my motivations are what they were and have been over the years. And so I'm trying to speak into existence that I'm trying to be better. And from now on, um, I'm only gonna tweet things that are good about the Buffalo News. Um, The stories from Dan Herbeck and Lou Michelle on the mob, Jay Tokaz's coverage of the Catholic Church. Um, Jason Wolf's been writing some some great columns or um, features over there. Uh, The rest of it, um, I need to stop. And it's uh, these tweets that I put out, um, you know, they're, uh, they're unhealthy and they're, they're unhealthy. Um, they make me look bad and they make people I care about upset. Um, so I'm, I'm, I can't vow to stop because I don't know, you know, who knows, maybe in a moment of weakness, I'll, and I don't, I'm not going to stay away from fair criticism either. Um, You know, I think that there are, there's fair criticism to be made, but anyway, that's my long soliloquy. And um, yeah, I, I, and look, there's another part of it too, just while I'm trying to get it all out. I didn't plan on, you know, I didn't write anything out. Um, There are some people over at one news Plaza who love my tweets because I say things that they can't. And I think that I take a little pride in that. And so I'm, as I'm sticking up for them, um, you know, they kind of enjoy it because these are things that they think, but can't say. Um, but I, I gotta be done with that. I, I think it's unhealthy for me. And, and Jonah used to look like you got something to say. Well, no, I, well, you said something that I agree with. I think, and I think I've told you this off the air too, is that, 
sometimes you tweet things and maybe the content of what you're saying in this context could be right, but it doesn't mean you should tweet it. It makes you look bitter and petty and worried about things that happened years ago. Even if maybe you are correct in what you were saying, it doesn't come across, I think, the same way you want it to. And I, right. maybe if I was you, I would be a little careful about some people who behind the scenes want you to tweet those things because why don't they tweet them themselves? And maybe they, they want you to say things that they're afraid to say or they shouldn't say or they can't say, and they make you take that, not the heat, but then everybody on Twitter sees this as your opinion and not that you're expressing an opinion to somebody else that can't or is unwilling to say that themselves. Well, that's kind of my reputation on social media. I, I don't give a fuck. And um, that's kind of where Jonah came up with the name of Tim Graham and friends, because it is TGAF and there's all kinds of ways you could take it. It's kind of part of my, it's like, I'll say whatever I want to say, because I've reached a place in my career where I can. Um, and, and thankfully, and I hope everybody uh, gets to a point in their life that they can just unload whenever they want uh, and say whatever they want. But I think I reveled, I revel in it too much. And I agree with you, Jonah. I, and a lot of people think, you know, that's why I think that there's a, a misconception out there that I got fired. Now, people always mention why I got fired from the Buffalo News uh, or laid off or whatever. Now, they've never done like, well, they have laid people off, but not in laid the me off. Um, they laid you, that's right. You, they did lay you off. Uh, I, you know, I left there willingly and I left there because I was heartbroken uh, over what was happening in the sports department at that time. Um, so uh, so yeah, I, it's it's not bitterness of what happened to me though, because I it, things it turned out okay you, for me. You understand what uh, I'm saying? Even if you're not bitter, the tweet that's exactly right. Bitter. People see it that way. Absolutely, things turned out great for me. They could not have turned out better for me, um, but it didn't turn out great for Bucky Gleason or for Jerry Sullivan um, or for all the clerks that got laid off or for Jonah Bronstein or for Amy Readers. Moritz and you know all the people who left. Um, you know, for Keith McShay, who wanted to be the sports editor and, uh, and not only didn't get the job, but was, was, uh, was transferred out of the sports department entirely. Um, for people like Miguel Rodriguez, who have to do more with less. Uh, for, you know, there's a lot of people there who, you know, so that, that's who I feel for. Those are the people, when I'm tweeting, I'm tweeting because I feel like I can, and it's something almost like I, I, I owed it to them. And I, I just, this is my, my venting. I don't know what's, what's the 12 step process. One of the steps is you, you're, you're out there and you got to like, let, you know, let it go and make, make amends or whatever. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to be reaching out to Mike Harrington and apologizing because I mean, every, I meant what I tweeted, but I got to stop doing it is, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't disagree. I mean, I think it's a good, probably a health, like you said, it's probably unhealthy. Like, and uh, as, as one of your F's um, I feel <laughs> like your health is important to me, your mental well being, your, who knows, physical, you know, well being from whatever stress that's caused you and I have very different approaches to social media in general. Um, I, if I have anything remotely controversial to tweet, I stare at it for a long time and usually delete it. <laughs> um, and I very much take a less is more approach to tweets. And, you know, I feel like I, do I have a massive following? No, but I've got enough to the point where like when I send out articles, people will click on them. Some people, you know, subscribe to, to the athletic and that's about all I need because it goes back to the conversation we had at the beginning with Josh Allen. I feel much more comfortable and, and obviously you do as well articulating some of these things on here and having this dialogue on here with our, our listeners who, um, you know, always seem open to the conversation and the back and forth. And I'd say the same about the podcast Joe and I do. It's like easier sometimes to get it out in the open here and then send out a tweet and deal with, like it causes physical stress. Some of the, the Twitter mentions like, so I can't imagine for you, like, when it becomes, you know, your, your fight or flight kicks in, you've got strangers in your pocket, like just saying whatever the hell they want and you're going to see it. And like, 
I don't know, over the years, I've just taken that to be like, I don't want any of it. I don't want, I could tweet out the most innocuous thing about a Josh Allen pass and have people telling me to F off because the receiver didn't run the right route or there's something I didn't see in real time, or even I was right, but they thought, screw you because they've had six beers and they're watching the game. And it's just like, I don't know. I don't need, I just don't need any of it. And so I think you'll be better off. Yeah, I think so too. And I think there's a strange dynamic that I, that I, I think coming to the athletic may, you know, that really makes it that much more confusing to me is, you know, the attitude that we get from our readers and the relationship that we have with our readers is incredibly healthy. And maybe because it's fresh, you're starting from a new spot. By and large. I, almost I, three. By yeah, and large it is. The comment section are glowing. It's gotten um, more. The comment section is not as 100% bulletproof as it was right. at the beginning. When we started, it was amazing. It was like there was the regulars in there. Now it's like, you know, if I write an opinion piece, there's times where I'll shield myself from the comments for my mental well-being. No offense sure. to anybody in there that's trying to have a conversation, but that for me personally – Same with Twitter, you know, comments like we can pretend to be like tough guys and that none of it gets to us. Like Rodak, you know, was I marveled at the way Rodak kind of handled everything and was able to let a lot of it roll off. But I'm sure some of it didn't. And it's human nature. Some of us are more sensitive to it than others. And like you said, you're at a point in your career where you really don't have to care as much or can. um and you didn't come up with these things either, right? You you got to a point where you were comfortable enough and secure enough as a writer and as a, um, you know, with your takes or whatever else, you harnessed all that before this thing ever came along. And, you know, coming up with it while you're kind of figuring things out and like, you know, the first, you know, whatever, seven years I've been on the beat, it's like, it's not, it's not healthy for, I don't think it's a healthy tool for the industry in general in a lot of ways, because like you said, there's probably people that were triggered by the fan reaction when they were thinking about what to write about Josh Allen, myself included. Like, do I cover this? Do I want to deal with this? Do I want to tweet something out? Um, And there's a performative nature, I think, to what you're talking about um, that's present throughout Twitter, throughout media, when I'm going to ask this- I'm going to ask this question because all the other guys in the media are going to see what a tough guy I am. And I've been guilty of that hundred percent or, you know, I, I asked the hard question. So watch me, watch me go when I don't even need the question answered, you know? So right. um, I think that's the same in your case is like, I'm going to send these tweets out. Cause I know I'm going to get texts from X, Y, and Z at the news saying, ah, hell yeah, man, you got them. When really like that's a short term, dopamine boost and there's going to be a bunch of tweets of people saying horrible stuff or like all it takes is a few people even if they're anonymous even if they've got like we, and you can dunk on the thing them thing is is that the twitter responses are are overwhelmingly they're usually good yeah, you're, you're right you know, they, yeah they get me too but it's i still it, you know it digs into my my conscience you know and and, and again i i, I just I guess just to finish the thought about the athletic and being healthy. I mean, I genuinely, and I think I was this way with the Buffalo news too. It's this such a large institution and it got along for so many years. It didn't matter if somebody dropped off as a subscriber or whatever, we're going to do what we do. We are the Buffalo news and you can subscribe if you want. If not, sorry, you can't do that anymore. And in fact, you know, the, the whole concept of, you know, telling, blocking potential subscribers, telling thousands of people uh, over the course of weeks, you know, to get bent. Uh, I, I mean, it's, it's, and then I see people over there who are worried about getting laid off because the money's not coming in uh, or the money that's getting wasted on, on other things in the sports department. So anyways, that's why I say, it, and it's just such a healthier thing at the athletic. I just need to embrace that the teamwork that we have, um, you know, the fact that we, that, that there is, there does seem to be, and, and the animosity from the audience too, now let's, I'm not going like, to discount that. I think there are people who just hate the Buffalo news, um, you know, and so there's this combative thing, or you work at the Buffalo news as a reporter, well, customer service can handle that, or um, what, you know, the, you know, te- the tech people can handle that. You know, so what if our app doesn't work? The tech people get, or they're the con, the, the, um, 
the feeling of people refusing to work together in departments because they don't like, you know, I don't like that guy, so, but you're all, you're just, it's a cancer. And me pointing out with, you know, with passive aggressive, uh, you know, dunks, you know, whether I'm doing three sixties uh, or, or whatever, uh, it's, it's, it's fun for about a minute and it really does, you know, get to be unhealthy for me. And so I got to let it go and let the Buffalo news be whatever it is, it's going to be. And um, my tweets aren't going to matter one way or the other, because look, if I, if I had any influence, um, they would have made some changes by now anyway, and they're clearly not making those changes. So um, it is what it is. I, you know, just to, and, and, I, and I'll apologize to the people over there who, and they know who they are. The people who know that I care for them, uh, I'm apologizing to you for upsetting you. Not necessarily apologizing for my, the sentiments that I put out there. I stand by my sentiments. Uh, I'm not, I don't, I don't say things for effect. I generally, I mean, I mean them, but I'm going to stop saying them and, or at least endeavor as, as best I can to, to stop. Roll tide. Roll tide. Yeah. I think uh, it's, um, any, it's... any final thoughts uh, before we wrap up here? No, I mean, I guess we're out of time to talk about WrestleMania. <laughs> oh, you know what? So it's to put a bow on what we were just talking about. Thank you for mentioning WrestleMania. One of the triggers I think that sent me on, as he uses the phrase, my road to Damascus uh, regarding this was Lex Luger. Um, Lex on Luger last made week's me podcast, reevaluate my whole life with some of the things he said. He says some deep stuff. I mean, regardless of where, what your level of religious commitment is Lex Luger says said some philosophical things and the number one thing that he said last week that I think really put me in this frame of mind um, and then I think the stuff that happened at Cumulus also kind of helped it foment in the sense of I hope some people learn that they don't just discredit or discount second chances or whatever you know some self-reflection um Jonah, we even had a discussion a few, you know, maybe a week or so ago, regarding some self-reflection on how I listened to Howard Stern, who I love and have listened to for, for 30 years, and, and what, you know, the things that I used to enjoy from the show that I don't anymore, and how you need to evolve, and how Rob Lederman and everybody, and the, well, all this stuff. So self-reflection, evolution. Um, Lex Luger had the comment, um, he said that resentment is drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. And I thought that that was incredibly profound. Maybe that's a saying, that's a cliche that's probably been out there. I don't think he invented it, but it's the first time I've heard it said that way. And um, that was really a bit of a, an epiphany for me. So Lex Luger, AKA Larry Full, um, thank you. I'm sure AKA he's not listening to this, nor did he get an hour and a half in. I'm sorry, what's that, Jonah? AKA the narcissist. AKA the narcissist, AKA the total package. Uh, so thanks to Lex. So that brings in Marcel Louis Jacques on this podcast, Lex Luger. If you've been following along, this is going to turn into like a Marvel universe type meshing where every episode from now All on is going to have different references where you're going to have to go back and listen to every episode of Tim Graham and friends brought to you by CTBK. You got a lot of, probably not. To give. I'll be golfing with a listener who tomorrow, who will undoubtedly be able to connect all of these threads. And he will probably mention that I mentioned him just now. So <laughs> this is a test to see if he made it to the end of the podcast. Exactly. I'll bet that you're golfing with two people who listen to this podcast. One, I know for sure listens to every episode. The other probably says he listens to a lot of episodes and probably he's an F. He's an F. He's, <laughs> he's an F of the show, though. He's but a dear F of that, the show. I don't know that he's how we'll see how loyal a listener he is. Uh, based on okay what I hear about this is this. a test all right guys have a great weekend uh, thanks for letting me uh get that off my chest at the end and um it's uh i feel better about it um i'm sure others uh, are would feel better knowing that uh, if if i actually follow through they'll probably like it 
Um, but um, and there are probably some people who don't give a single F. You're right. See what I did there. Most people, most people don't give a single F what what I do or say. Uh, there are some people who are going to be disappointed, though. Uh, anyways, thanks, everybody, for listening to Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTB Gay. It's C- All right, let me start over. Especially if you've gotten this far. My deep gratitude, uh, since I botched uh, the sponsor's name, let me try that again, to everyone who's listening to this and all previous and any future Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTBK. Tim Graham and Friends is brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and business consultants. CTBK is a leading accounting firm with a growing team of accountants and business consultants with roots in Amherst, New York. CTBK pairs every project with a focus on a human connection between its team and the client for assurance, accounting, taxes, litigation support, and advice on mergers and acquisitions, CTBK is available and ready to solve any issue your business faces. For a consultation or to request a quote, call 716-630-2400. Again, that's 716-630-2400. CTBK, over a quarter century of proven accounting and business excellence for Western New York and beyond. Tim Graham and Friends is brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and business consultants. CTBK is a leading accounting firm with a growing team of accountants and business consultants with roots in Amherst, New York. CTBK pairs every project with a focus on a human connection between its team and the client for assurance, accounting, taxes, litigation support, and advice on mergers and acquisitions. CTBK is available and ready to solve any issue your business faces. For a consultation or to request a quote, call 716-630-2400. Again, that's 716-630-2400. CTBK, over a quarter century of proven accounting and business excellence for Western New York and beyond.